And thank you, Linda. And it's my great delight and pleasure to introduce Nancy Parker and uh, Robert Holmberg. And uh, before we start with their presentations, I'd like to give a little bit of a background uh, for, for each uh, of the presenters. I've known them for many, many years. Nancy, um, it, as, you, as some of you may know, is an independent uh, researcher and consultant working um, from uh, at her office in Athabasca. And she has a wonderful, rich and strong background. She holds a PhD in history from York University and uh, she was conferred in 1999. And uh, she has extremely great sessional experience at the University of Alberta, University of Victoria, Brad McEwen, and um, she has extensive uh, institutional research positions at ABC Laclabiche, Portage College, and of course at the Basque University. Nancy has been pivotal and significant in, in involving a lot of um, Athabasca University's quality assurance and accreditation initiatives throughout the years. Um, she chaired the Alberta University's Graduate Survey Consortium. And Nancy also ha has uh, been Athabasca's institutional liaison officer uh, to the Middle States Commission. Uh, on higher education. She continues to serve as a volunteer peer reviewer for the commission, which is an extremely important uh, aspect of, of the work. Um, so uh, she, Nancy has also co-chaired the Data Standards, Integrity and Security Working Group um, at Athabasca University uh, Administrative Systems Renewal Project um, over uh, a few years in 2012 and 13. Nancy is very well published in fields of criminal justice, history, quality assurance, and higher education marketing. She's participated on research teams who developed an uh, academic analytics tool, and she's assessed uh, Athabasca University's Learning to Learn online MOOC, which um, has been continuing over the years. And currently, Nancy is plugging away on a monograph about the history of Athabasca University, for which she's conducted numerous interviews with former faculty and administrative staff members, including Robert. And for me, also very special, um, near and dear to my heart, Nancy has been integral in um, securing funds and working towards um, Indigenous partnerships and, uh, and an Indigenous project that we've worked on for over 10 years called the Learning Communities Project. So welcome, Nancy. And as you all know, Robert Holmberg um, has been so, so heavily involved with science outreach and, and the work of Athabasca University. And Robert holds a, a, a bachelor and master's degree from the University of Saskatchewan. And uh, he holds a doctorate degree from Simon Fraser University in BC. Robert joined Athabasca University in Edmonton in 1974. And at that time, there were only 30 people in the staff um, complement there. Robert then um, retired. Uh, if you could call it retirement in Athabasca at, in 2007. But over the 33 years, he helped develop 13 science courses and helped deliver 18 of these. Initiated, he, Robert initiated the idea that Athabasca University should adopt the Athabasca River Basin. And um, as such, um, over the years, uh, um, he planted the seeds of the formation of the Athabasca Re uh, River Basin Research Institute, um, starting from 2007, when uh, in, the, in late December 2013, 2014, the Bo Board of Governors had actually officially established um, the institute as a formal institute of the university. 
Um, Robert is a strong advocate that universities should help educate the general public as well as its students. He's a founding member of Science at Outreach Athabasca, which began in 2001. And Robert has given so many presentations, over 300 presentations. And as you know, uh, they're mostly on spiders and other arthropods to students ranging from pre-kindergarten to those in graduate studies. Um, since his retirement about 15 years ago, he's re remained very active with Athabasca University and other organizations. Roberts obtained government and industry grants to develop the bibliography of the Athabasca River Basin with more than 30,000 science entries donated to um, Arbery in 2009. He uh, initiated the Athabasca River Basin Image Bank with Athabasca University Library in 2012. Robert also has organized 67 photography exhibits at AU, at the, at, at AU and recently he's prepared 22 videos on YouTube for Science Outreach Athabasca. So welcome Nancy and Robert and we look forward to hearing about the technology and the evolution of Athabasca University. Over to you. Okay, Th thank you. Thank you, Lisa. So we'll go right in. Uh, this is the uh, Athabasca University standard uh, acknowledgement to the Indigenous people of Canada. And this photograph is the university's uh, ceremonial mace. And if you look carefully, you'll see it uh, three more times in, in this presentation. So we've divided up the presentation into these six parts. I'm going to do the first, the third, and the last one. Nancy's going to do the second, fourth, and the fifth parts. And here we go for the introduction. Words mean different things to different people, even though we often think they're, that we, we know the meanings of them. Uh, it's, I always find it useful to, to go over them and see what my definitions are compared to yourselves. And, um, so technology is, is basically techniques and machines, and the techniques uh, include procedures, methods, and software, and the machines are sometimes called hardware. And in the case of this presentation, it means to record data or information, to reproduce or duplicate that, that data, and to transmit that data. Now, uh, the advantages of technology, uh, there's two main things. Uh, one is to increase productivity. And uh, that's to save time, to uh, save uh, turnaround times, uh, eliminate boring, repetitive tasks for individuals, but also to monitor the progress of individuals or, or of pr procedures. And then it hopefully reduces human errors and improves uh, quality control. And the second thing is it's supposed to reduce costs. Now, the disadvantages of technology is that it can increase costs, especially if there's capital costs in initially. And the other thing is it dehumanizes interactions and it is often inflexible for exceptions and alternatives. Now, evolution is simply change over time and the forces for change or evolution within universities are both internal and external. So internal are the people of the institution uh, with their different backgrounds and ideas and ideals. They make policies and the policies drive the institution. External includes governments of, of provincial and federal, and they uh, um, have policies and, and budgets that uh, affect the university. And then there's world external events. And for example, the economy and the price of oil affects, affects universities. And then of course, technologies that we're dealing with primarily tonight, but also these other internal and external uh, factors do uh, play into things and sometimes we refer to them as well. So universities are, are simply institutions of higher education, meaning that they usually are for students who have finished high school. Now, at universities have three main activities. One is formal education or teaching. The second one is research, and we're not really uh, talking about that uh, this evening. And the third one is service, and that includes expert consulting, which be paid or unpaid, 
and then community outreach or what I like calling informal education as we're doing uh, with this presentation through Science Outreach Athabasca. So education hopefully leads to learning and learning includes information, which conventions, those little squiggly lines mean, mean things uh, to, to us. And then we talk about facts and theories and theories definitely change over time. And sometimes even facts change over time as we get inform more information. And the second thing is skills, abilities, and methods. And some of them are, are completely mental activities such as uh, mathematics, logic, cri uh, critical thinking, and others in, in involve uh, manual dexterity in gymnastics, music, dissection. And then the third are values, morals, and beliefs. And these are the most uh, controversial of the things that are taught in the educational system. So ideally, the student is a person who wants to learn. In reality, it's often they want a, a satisfactory grade. And there are non-students who think that, that education is a commodity which could be bought and sold and not earned. So a teacher is a person who, who uh, assists students learning and they use pedagogy or educational theory to find the best methods for assisting learning. And I use methods because different students and different subjects require different methods. So it's not just one method for all learning. And formal education involves evaluating how much students learn. And this means testing or examination, which leads to grades, which leads to credentials. And now we're going to pass this over to, to Nancy, who's going to talk about the origins of Athabasca University between 1967 and 1984. And if I get this right, I should be able to share screen. Can you take over, Nancy? I'm trusting my slides are now up. Yes. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to provide some highlights from what was the original uh, statement of intention by the social credit government for the founding of the university on to the announce the uh, formation of the campus here in Athabasca. So very quick overview. And I'll start with 1967. To put things in context, Star Trek was on the television. The Beatles' Penny Lane was on the radio, and it was Canada's centennial year. Times had changed, and the province was coming of age with more urban than rural graduates. And Premier Ernest Manning recognized the need for change. And this white paper indicated a shift from developing infrastructure and resources to human development. And it included the need for a fourth university to meet future demands for highly trained professionals. And they did have some very interesting language under, underscoring that the economy should be serving people, not being their masters. There was a lot of enrollment pressure in the 60s uh, at the beginning of the decade, Alberta had one of the lowest participation rates in the country with only 4% of the usual 18 to 22 year old cohort in full-time undergraduate studies. By 1971, that rate had increased to 18%. Things leveled off in the 1970s, but planning for Alberta's fourth university was well underway. And the intention was to have a functional campus by 1973. Tim Byrne, moved from his post as the Deputy Minister of Education to become the first president of the new university. He did not want to privilege any particular religious denomination by naming it after a missionary or anybody of a particular political persuasion. So he thought he was choosing a neutral name. There were many reasons to choose the name Athabasca. The town was not one of them. But the first order in council is usually marked as the start of the university in the 1970. 
And the intention was to have an undergraduate model that was going to be interdisciplinary in its focus, somewhat like the University of California at Santa Cruz. The location was uh, going to use some of the lands from a federally run residential school. So it took some while to transfer the, the titles. And there was a clerical error that actually rescinded the original order in council when they were trying to change the composition of the council. So it was a short-lived error, but the university started and ended very quickly there. But then it really was put into limbo when 35 years of social credit rule ended in 1971. This is a title from a journal headline from May 1972 that indicated there would be an indefinite suspension. But Byrne had managed to negotiate the possibility of a mini college pilot, but any decisions about the future location of the institution were put on hold. And the minister had to remind those in his home riding of Red Deer not to get their hopes up. The next step was to start an experiment in practical planning. And they modified the original concepts and followed from inspirations that were identified in the Worth Report to try to undertake a pilot to use the design and delivery of multimedia courses. And they brought on a small staff to start developing materials. They had four fields of study and a warning about the temporary status of the institution. And the critical questions was whether there was sufficient demand or what learning systems might meet that demand. But there was very real doubt whether the case would be made to continue. One of the experiments they used to assess potential, potential demand was to publish the materials for world ecology in the newspaper. This series was a highly visible service to the general public, and it was used to grow support for the university, along with numerous broadcasts on access television. This gives you a snapshot of the staff that were working on the pilot. And eventually they did manage to secure cabinet approval but the institution had to wait well after its first convocation before it was finally granted permanent status in 1978. The students that they were serving in the early years were more female than male. And uh, more than half were between the ages of 24 and 44. And more than a fifth had less than high school education and 20% indicated that they were in, their occupation was housewife, not something you would hear today. Eventually, the friends in Athabasca put forward their lobby. And on the 12th of March, the announcement was made that the institution would be moving to the town. The president, uh, Sam Smith, resigned shortly thereafter, but the plans continued and the building opened in 1984. And now I can pass things back to Robert. Okay. Uh, slideshow. Oops, why am I not getting slideshow here? Uh, I'm overlapping uh, materials here. Ah. The, the Zoom bar is interfering with my PowerPoint. Okay, so I've divided up uh, the 20th century technologies of course production and, and delivery into the, the production and, and delivery aspects. So and I'm using 1970s to 1980s in a very general, general form. Uh, 
So following the concepts of, of distance learning, openness, and certain pedagogical uh, theories, uh, the university, as uh, Nancy said, had its emphasis on interdisciplinary studies. It uh, wanted to create modules of instruction without any prerequisites and to, that could be taken in virtually any, any sequence. And this meant that the courses had to be developed from ground up or from scratch because uh, most commercial um, materials were, were, would not fill the bill. And, and printed and audiovisual materials were to be developed in-house for efficiency and cost effectiveness. So they established mastery learning to begin with. It was set at 80%. And that meant that there was learning objectives and the formative or practice evaluation. There was lots of that before you hit the final or summative evaluation. And we hired uh, test students to try out the materials before they actually went to, to real, real students. So Athabasca University's first course that was started was World Ecology, the Scientific Context. It lasted over 14 years. It had the printed uh, AU materials, the record books. It had audio cassette recordings, and it had a few uh, commercial materials, the Scientific American off prints. But the first completed course was a humanities course, Ancient Roots of the Modern, modern World, started a little bit later than World Ecology, but finished uh, sooner. And uh, it, it relied on fewer record books and far more uh, commercial materials, but included 27 television programs that were produced with co cooperation of Access Television. So one of the things you have to think about with commercial materials is they limit flexibility of what you teach and the sequencing of that material, the evaluation of that material, and the revision schedules for your, for your courses. So I've divided course production uh, into these five, five areas, and we'll go through them uh, one at a time. So course production was done with a course team. The course team uh, used academics, which were called subject matter experts, SMEs, and they consulted with consultants and librarians to get the information. And then there was an instructional designer to work with the pedagogy and an editor who often worked with a copyright officer. And then there was visual designers who work with graphic artists and photographers. And the team was usually led by the instructional designer, sometimes by the editor, and occasionally by the subject matter expert. So whether we were dealing with print, audio, or video, it all started with a handwritten manuscript because there were no personal computers at that time. And it was typed up on an electric typewriter. And then it was revised by everybody under the sun. And it went through many, many revisions and many, many, many retypings before you finally got a, a product that everybody was happy with. And then it went to visual design and visual design uh, dealt with the illustrations where they can be diagrams, graphs, and photographs. And they also did the layout of the material. And this photograph is of a visual designer doing literally cutting and pasting. So she's cutting out the typeset material using wax to put it on a layout sheet. And uh, this uh, cutting and pasting uh, was very time consuming. And so it went to uh, technology, and this is an example of, of typesetting, uh, early typesetting, when we were using uh, paper tapes, punch tapes, to, to uh, eliminate a lot of the labor. So after you get your layout done, then you have plate making, and so that means a, a large format camera of, like this one was used to photograph the layout, and then plates were made. And these plates were usually metal, occasionally paper, and they're quite large because we did to four eight and a half by 11 inch uh, pages at, 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 at one time. And then these plates would be put into presses. And these are this is a photograph of the uh, university presses that, that we've, uh, we, we used for a while. And in order to get color, you start off with a white sheet of paper, you add black ink, you add cyan ink, you add magenta ink and yellow ink, and that's how you get uh, full color. But that means also four different plates have to be made and processed through the presses in order to get full color. Now, then the pages were cut to the right sizes. They were assembled. 
They were bound in certain ways. This is just showing uh, three hole punch, which is easy, but there is perfect binding. There is also coil binding of various kinds. And then it was stored uh, for waiting for, for students to enroll in that particular course. So audiovisual components, uh, there was the recording, the editing, and the duplication. Athabasca University did it for audio, but for video, uh, again, it was access television. So a course could contain many different components. The AU produced components, the commercial materials, uh, materials loaned by the library, and if it had a lab, some laboratory components. So uh, in the course delivery and communications now, um, again, due to the ideas of distance education, open, open learning and certain pedagogical uh, theories, uh, students could start at any weekday of, of any month. So we had over 200 start dates for students and they could uh, work at their own pace. And initially we had no uh, deadlines. We figured adults could, could, would, would go through at their own pace. Well, we quickly found out with no deadlines, a lot of students did nothing. And then tutors or academics. From the inception of the university to at least 1981, all academics were called tutors. And there's variations on that. Telephone tutors, because we use telephones. Local course tutors, when we tried to get local uh, students in a region to to uh, work with, with a tutor and then later course coordinators. And we dealt with both academic problems as well as administrative problems. And it wasn't until 1986, 87 when we started to use the term professor and that was usually uh, for full-time tutors in effect and to distinguish them from part-time tutors. And part-time tutors had uh, the same call it, kinds of qualifications, at least a master's degree or, or a PhD. So going back to world ecology, um, there were two means of communication, telephone tutoring and postal communication. And the postal communication included course registration, course materials, uh, tutor marked assignments and examinations. And because we, we put on um, this idea that we'd be using the post to send things back and forth, when we set in a deadlines, we chose six months rather than four months that is a traditional for uh, three credit courses. And that six month deadline is still with us today, even though we have instantaneous communication through the internet. So ancient, going uh, back again to ancient roots, it had the same thing of postal communication and telephone tutoring, but because it had the television uh, components, it had television broadcasting through, through access television. But the problem with both radio and television that we, we have done is that because we never had cohorts of students starting and stopping at the same time, we wanted these broadcasts to be repeated again and again and again. And the broadcast uh, stations, uh, of course, found this repetitious and not good for their other audiences. So we often would revert to the library sending out audio or video cassettes. This is a, a photograph of the early days of teleconferencing um, uh, when you have to press a button in order to uh, start speaking. And we had to have a switchboard operator and our own switchboard and pay for all the long distance uh, charges between the people. And this be became very cumbersome and expensive and, and we really didn't use it for very long. So I've already talked about audio and, and visual ma materials being loaned by, out by the library, but supplementary materials uh, uh, were also uh, used, uh, gone out to students via the library. And this later led to the digital reading room. And there were uh, rock and mineral kits. If you look on the bottom right, uh, there's an arrow pointing to those. And there were uh, models of various kinds. Uh, and uh, then there were also computer simulations as, as well. So I've defined a library, a laboratory here as, as a place where you do dangerous activities safely. And in most distance education institutions, they figure that laboratories are too expensive and are doing too many dangerous things and you can't do laboratories at a distance. Athabasca University did not take that, that attitude and we have done laboratory work at, at a distance. 
And, and this can also be used for fine arts in the, like, like in studio uh, work as well. But uh, this particular uh, graph I, I came up with in 1982 um, uh, when I was dealing with, with laboratory issues. So it's the interaction of six factors, the target audience or the students, the course content, how you want to uh, approach that content for the students, economics, safety, and of course, technology that we're talking about today. And safety, if you look at safety from a cyber uh, security point of view, all these six factors uh, are, are, can be thought of for any particular course uh, uh, that you're trying to do uh, at a distance. And Athabasca University overcame the problems of laboratories in five different, different ways. First of all, was face-to-face -face labs as in a traditional kind of lab or traditional kinds of activities. But instead of students coming in once a week over a semester, it would be concentrated uh, at a convenient time for in four to six days. And this also could be done in the field. And this is a photograph of our uh, plant taxonomy course being conducted in the field. And then there was computer simulations. And if you look at this diagram, you can see in the past, up to the say two, 2000, you can, you can uh, find out what, how things progress that whatever you're looking at. And then by uh, manipulating the variables, you get different future uh, possibilities. And so a lot of our, our uh, courses use computer simulations such as this. There's also virtual labs, which we really didn't uh, do, at least as of yet. Now there's also home lab kits. And this is an example of a home lab kit using very cheap expendable materials supplemented uh, by things that you'd find in a student's home. But for more expensive, uh, more durable equipment, um, we've, we've used uh, these kinds of, of, of lab kits and these are being used, used today in this particular case in physics and physiology. So then there's the uh, remote control of centralized lab equipment. So a lot of lab equipment these days is run by computer. If you hook it up to the internet, it means that students using their own computers can, can, uh, can manipulate that equipment and find out uh, information. We've only done this once. Martin Connor set up uh, a uh, ball drop experiment in physics but it is possible to do it with a lot of other, other things as well, to cut down on, on going to traditional labs. And then the fifth way was, was uh, it, uh, individual activities. Uh, so personalized research or citizen science projects or, oops, sorry, or, or going to on field trips to galleries, museums, commercial establishments as part of a, a learning contract. And, and we've done those things. So now Nancy is going to take over and talk about transforming open and, and distance learning and the 21st century technologies for e-learning and support. So I should stop sharing and Nancy should be able to take over, I hope. Thank you, Robert. And I trust that my slides are up and viewable at this time. Yes. And, <laughs> okay. And I'll just go ahead and uh, this little section is uh, going to be very uh, fast review of some of the developments in open distance learning and some of the theory that informed it. And then I will be looking at Athabasca University examples specifically. So if I'm going to jump ahead from Robert's 1970s and 80s to more recent times, we are looking at 40 years in educational technology. This is a word cloud from the media message, which was the, uh, our, the journal for Amtech and its inheritor journal, the Canadian Journal for Learning and Technology, had uh, articles that I pulled from the mid 20 teens and you can see the difference here is the emphasis from television and film to online and digital learning. This is possible because technologies did change very rapidly. And part of that was information and communication technologies that included computer assisted instruction, which was 
actually started in the 1960s and Plato was a very popular uh, operation through the 70s. And then Canada actually invented the Teledon system, which was piloted in some of Athabasca University's courses. And for those who really want to geek out here, it used a material directory that mirrored the Unix tree structures. And by the 1990s, there was more emphasis on two-way communication online. And Athabasca University adapted different systems for its innovative online graduate programs. And this was also because technology was developing in the homes. This is what I would consider to be a luggable portable computer and one of the first ones I worked on. And the more five years later, uh, we have actually a battery powered system. And this one, I could actually run WordPerfect 5.0 as long as I booted it from the actual drives. Even more dramatic shifts were in terms of the memory devices available and the increased processing speeds and drop in price and memory changed how computer programs would be written. More and more these days we rent server space on the cloud. For students and tutors, it's hard to overstate the importance of the shift to emails. In the 1990s, the number of staff using email addresses was small enough at Athabasca University that many of them just used their first name, like Robert, the head of the at sign. By the late 1990s, Athabasca had a well-established home on the internet. The homepage had to load very efficiently, so every visual design was considered. Keyword searches were collected and analyzed to see what information was needed on the front page. Searches for courses and programs were used to assess potential demand. These days you'd call that analytics. Automation was still a few steps away because the online application forms had to be completed and then printed out and manually entered into the student record system. This is a case where AU's front-facing tools ran well ahead of what its back-end systems could support. This is a course view from an early experiment that was run on an actual department server. And you can see that the offline op options were clearly stated, and this was designed for people with a computer and modem. Psychology introduced online quizzes very early on and the immediate feedback matched a cognitive behaviorist approach to instruction, but it also meant reducing the marking workloads and therefore the pay of individual tutors. The intention to move online was constrained by the ability of students to actually access the materials. There was very real concerns about the digital divide. While the number of home computers among AU students ran more than twice the national adver average, the connection speeds did not keep pace. This map actually shows internet service availability in Canada in 2019, and it reminds us that broadband is still very much an urban infrastructure, and that satellite connections are available for some, but clearly not all, remote communities. The lack of reliable high-speed internet is a handicap for people forced to work from home. And this raises some questions internationally as well. But I can say that the delivery of higher education has been informed by social economic structures in society, which in turn informed the theoretical underpinnings of the media and methods used for instruction. So this is your 30 second review of educational theory, where you have an art agrarian or artisanal society that would have a didactic, that is I teach you learn or Socratic, I question you think approach supported with itinerant scholars. If you think of an industrial bureaucratic system that's more aligned with a cognitive or behaviorist approach where we look for ways to motivate students and measure their progress. And what Robert showed was the correspondence and broadcast side of that. If you think of a more globalized economy, you can think of constructivist or relativist approaches where students are expected to situate knowledge and collaborate with each other to create new understandings. 
That requires two-way communications through telelearning, audio or video conferencing, multimedia simulations and discussion boards. And the next generation after that would be networked or connectivist approaches where students create artifacts and facilitators curate them. That would bring us to massive open online courses supported with automation and user generated content. All these different approaches have been applied in different ways at different times by the very large open le learning institutions. This table lists some of the more significant institutions by the date that they were founded. While the Open University in the United Kingdom was a touchstone for many, it was not the first, nor is it currently the largest. UNISA's distance delivery unit was established in 1946, and there was quite a growth in open universities around the world in the 1970s. And currently the two largest ones are China's Open University and Indira Ganda's Open University, and that both of those have more than 3 million students. Athabasca doesn't compare to that, but I just want to touch on some highlights to give you the shifts at what has happened in Athabasca, and this is by no means a full inventory. So one of the things that technology provided for is to serve greater numbers of students. This, show, this shows you how fast the growth was in the early part of the 2000s and where sustainability became more of a question in the mid 20 teens. From what was available in annual reports, you can see that we had a peak of over 1400 staff members in 2010, but 150 of those were actually temporary employees attached to uh, externally funded projects. But the whole notion of a scalable model of delivery is to keep the number of full-time faculty relatively stable and have their workload determined by the programs and courses they oversee rather than direct student contact. This is what you think of as an industrial division of labor with automation providing tools to achieve the ever sought economies of scale. Self-service through the website was a critical to increasing the numbers of students. The MyAU portal was an innovation with conditional displays of relevant in information, depending on which type of student was logging in. AskAU was a natural language query tool that used an ever-expanding knowledge base to self-support. And this slide actually says uh, Athabasca was a leading online education specialist, and that was because there were two other unimodal distance education institutions in Canada at that time, the Open Learning Agency in BC, which became part of Thompson Rivers University, and Tele University in Quebec, which is somewhat in limbo right now. The success in shifting online was in part due to the willingness to experiment and adapt while maintaining a full suite of student support. The front line is supported through constituency relationship management or CRM tools that are, uh, allow queries to be escalated and moved to the appropriate departments. But there was a full suite of resources available and access for students with disabilities, this is much about universal design principles as specific accommodations, but in all of the learner support, it is important to remember that the academics and the students associations were partners in the success of the institution. One other aspect that contributed to early success was the commitment to service levels. We might not be able to compete against commercial publishing houses in terms of materials, but we can certainly compete in terms of service. This also reflected some of the divisions of labor for the frontline staff. I can say that finding the expect the best commitments is a little more, more challenging on the website these days. Another aspect of providing access for 
open learning was to have no prerequisites for many undergraduate courses and to let people decide whether or not they were ready to take a university level course, we had a series of are you ready questionnaires. The idea was to stop an open door from becoming a revolving door. The first decade of this century brought increasing numbers of courses online. And while there were concerns over what barriers might be created, the expansion of home computing meant that there was less and less need to specify the particular systems students needed to access. The 177 courses that were converted to online learning represented more than 60% of the undergraduate curriculum. All of the graduate programs were fully online from their founding. And they used many different learning management systems. And there was enough of an expansion that there were viable commercial options through WebCT, Blackboard, and uh, Brightspace is now the new institutional preference. But we also pursued open source. Sakai was developed by Simon Fraser University. Athabasca developed its own learning management system that uh, worked in the Masters of Arts and in Integrated Studies. And eventually the institution chose Moodle. And this is a screenshot of the student training course for Moodle. And it featured a common set of navigations where the course topics would be on the left-hand side and the notices on the right-hand side. And another significant thing about this was to have electronic submission of assignments that could be tracked by more than just an individual email account. So Robert talked about what was going on in the 70s and 80s and what we left behind in the 20 teens included getting rid of modules without prerequisites and courses from the ground up, the notion of mastery learning and most of the print-based material, the typesetting was gone and the use of te test, test, test students was gone very soon along with the emphasis on interdisciplinary studies, as more and more the intention was to find courses that would be transferable to other institutions. We did keep course teams with a slightly different configuration, learning objectives and formative and summative evaluation and visual design. So if anything in a computerized environment, the layout was even more important especially as we were competing with commercial materials. And the commercial packages expanded to move to e-texts, provide self-study guides, question and answer bags, manuals, and even exams. And the institution moved to print on demand models, where, but more and more content was the emphasis, not materials. And that meant instead of having a individual study guide that was printed, it would be within the course shell and only the commercial materials would be wrapped and shipped out. I chose this homepage uh, just to capture some of the changing flavor of the times. Uh, and also uh, this was one of our Olympian alumni and I also wanted to highlight how individualized study had, you had to register before the 10th of the month to start the following month. And the 20 day lag instead of register today, start tomorrow was largely a function of back end processing for assigning students to individual tutors and the workarounds from a student information database that was around fixed term start and end dates. It is not at all easy to make rolling open admission work in a standard learning student information database. Experimentation also continued often off the side of somebody's desk. And this is a page um, second life that had a scripted interactions with famous figures in the history of psychology. This was a real milestone for the institution when in 2009, 
the knowledge infrastructure program was actually applied to our IT infrastructure. And the successful projects in the suite included desktop virtualization through Citrix, web and video conferencing, content management, course tracking, degree audit and program planning through DegreeWorks. And we were perhaps less successful with some of the gradebook integrations we were hoping for. And we also were able to digitize a lot of our content through the Community Adjustment Fund. All this and the expenses entail did catch the attention of the Auditor General and the $90 million uh, IT infrastructure improvement plan uh, did get its share of reviews and the aging administrative systems were enough of a concern that the institution eventually had to draw down some of its reserves to upgrade them. And even though many post-secondaries had the same issues with disaster recovery, the province did nothing to support collaborative solutions. And there were common lessons on managing risks. And part of that managing change was to make the shift to e-learning easier for students. And I should say that e-texts could be proprietary or they could be open source and open educational resources were a very big theme for the institution, including these showcase courses. And I circled the le learning outcomes that were expected for this course to show that that instruction by objective still remained. Another Notable development was with Massive Open Online Courses, or MOOCs, where literally thousands of students can join in. And this is a collaboration with the Commonwealth of Learning that will be starting next week. And we eventually moved away from open source to more corporate cloud solutions. And there will be a new integrated learning environment that is going to use Desire to Learn's Brightspace for the course system and Lucian in the administrative systems. And the institution now bills itself as an open, and instead of an open, it is now an online institution. And that takes us to Robert. Okay, so. Come on. It won't. Oh, here we go. Okay, conclusions. So how technology helped a AU students? So tens of thousands of students have, have improved their education through, through Athabasca University in the last around 48 years. And uh, this has been done with reduction of time and, and place re restrictions. And we've improved the inter interaction capabilities between students and AU courses. And we've reduced uh, turnaround times and we've uh, lessened the cost of course delivery and, and duplication of, of course materials. So what have we done externally is we've improved attitudes in other educational, traditional educational institutions about the uh, ability to, to offer instruction uh, for students at a distance. Uh, it's uh, distance education is a lot more acceptable than it was initially. And uh, that uh, many of the traditional laboratory or related activities uh, can, be, can be done uh, with fewer restrictions that uh, they were in traditional institutions. And uh, we persuaded electronic uh, text publishers to offer their materials in a non-semester basis. Um, because the semester basis is still prevalent in most educational institutions. So limitations of technology in general, uh, the senses of hearing and vision are really well done with technology today, but the senses of touch, uh, taste, and, and odor are not. So touch in terms of, say, dissection work, taste in terms of tasting rocks that uh, geologists do or in cookery, and also an order or odor for detecting uh, chemicals of various kinds. And uh, some traditional laboratory and studio activities are still too expensive or too dangerous to do uh, remotely. And we have to remember that humans are social animals and we require social interaction. 
Okay, problems with, uh, with technology and distance and open learning. One of the big things we always fight with is, does pedagogy determine learning methods or does technology determine learning methods? And to give you an example of this, uh, is in, in certain courses, you might want students to be able to write essays, but with the technology of today, they tend to like machine scored examinations because they're easy to mark. The other thing is standardization. It leads to less administrative work, and so it cuts costs. But on the other hand, it restricts uh, creativity and, and change. And uh, then we have to deal with uh, centralized versus distributed resources, or in technological speak, integrated enterprise uh, systems versus federated ones. And then the proprietary or commercial uh, programs versus the open open source ones. And then everybody likes security, but nobody likes to be under surveillance. And a lot of these programs do a lot of surveillance of the users. Okay, wh where, where could AU do better with technology is encouraging more diversity and innovation, uh, keeping courses up to date. And we have not done well with small enrollment courses like in third and fourth year, for, for the majors that we're trying to offer. And uh, we don't still don't have a clear undergraduate course numbering system. Our, our first year courses start with the number two rather than the number one. And remote and virtual lab activities we have not, not done very well with. Okay, lessons for Athabasca University. Uh, learning is primarily, I repeat, primarily an individual activity, but providing that learning remotely requires many different people and teamwork. And technology does not eliminate all need for face-to-face -face interactions. And the, there's traces of old technologies that are, are still with us, with us today and should have been gotten rid of a long time ago. Okay, there's four lessons, basically. Uh, technology evolves rapidly, and so you need to plan and to budget for, for replacements. Uh, the newest technology is not necessarily the best. And, and when you're starting a new, new system, you have to remember that the initial results are usually failure. And uh, therefore you should uh, only test out new technologies on limited scale and make sure that they are sig make significant improvements, not just minor improvements, but significant improvements. And one size, one program, one way of doing things does not fit all. Universities offer a universe of courses to a great variety of students, so one size does not fit all. And fourth, each technological shift has its own benefits and its own risks. So we've given references to various uh, publications throughout the presentation in our slides, but these are more uh, general uh, publications that you might wish to refer to when, when this presentation is, is put on the YouTube channel for Science Outreach Athabasca. And we wanted some further acknowledgements. Uh, one is that Athabasca University has nearly died a few times and we we're, we're, uh, want to acknowledge the people who persevered and, and had, it, had it continue. And the, in the photographs uh, used in this presentation, the people who participated in the photographs and the people who took the photographs we wish to acknowledge, but also the Wayback Machine that, that allowed us to use uh, uh, web pages that no longer exist. And with special thanks to the Thomas A. Edge archives uh, for the photographs and to Jesse Carson who allowed us access to them. So with that, I open up the floor to Nancy and myself for, for any questions you may have. Thank you, Robert and, uh, and Nancy. I think that that was such a comprehensive um, overview and very, very well done um, about the history of uh, the development of the technologies in education at Athabasca University. So um, I'm here to moderate, and if everybody would be able to, uh, you, you could just step in and ask questions to Nancy and Robert. Thank you.
Hi, it's Mike McLean, and it is a bit tongue in cheek, but where's where's our new president? I sure would have. I hope we send a link to the recording of this to uh, Dr. Peter Scott. So yeah, it'd have been great to see him. I, I guess I just feel like more and more we talk about the technology and delivery and so many people at the very top sort of part of the institution, however you wanna call it that way, don't seem to be really invested in some ways to what what got us this far. Like a lot of great history was covered in this short hour and I appreciate it. It's uh, Dietmar, can I ask a question? Absolutely, Dietmar, go ahead. Yeah, so so I'm, I'm gonna ask Robert and Nancy, maybe if you can kind of get your crystal ball out because it's been uh, kind of an interesting couple of years and you've probably heard this question before, but uh, I would be really interested in your opinion of what, what you saw happen the last two years and more interested in, as, as you know, uh, a lot of people say, oh, we're getting back to normal, whatever that is. Um, what are, what do you see as, as maybe changing in higher education, given that, you know, uh, a lot of people have been kind of thrown into doing remote sort of learning for the last couple of years? Um, so I think that uh, people have discovered uh, some helpful affordances. I think they've also discovered that it's not easy to do distance education well. So just throwing a professor in front of a Zoom uh, with a bunch of slides is not necessarily going to support students effectively. And I think we've seen uh, that there's been some real pressures on students for that uh, side of things. I do think that we are going to see more blended options. I do think that the notion that somehow distance education is very mysterious and can't be done well uh, has been shot down, but we have seen a lot of bad examples uh, as well as some good ones. I don't know, what do you think, Robert? Well, one of the things is I, I showed you that 1982 paper uh, about doing labs at a distance and it got no interest whatsoever until COVID hit. And now I've had through ResearchGate, 3,300 people have read that paper well, in the first 20 years or more, it was one or two. So there is an interest in doing labs at a distance and doing um, uh, university uh, instruction at a distance. And uh, so I, I think it's improving. Uh, when I first started with AU, of course, we were a correspondence institution, basically, and correspondence had a very bad name. And after COVID, everybody is doing distance education, at least with lectures. And, and as Nancy said, uh, it's not just a simple method of do, uh, set up of setting up a camera and having a talking head. And uh, I think that AU is poised to, to capitalize on that uh, because we've had the experiences. We, we know some of the things to do and some of the things not to do. So uh, I think that distance education, um, I've predicted it long before that, that continuing education for a lot of professionals is done at a distance and that's going to make it a more palatable uh, alternative for face-to-face. For -face. Uh, so I think a distance education is, is finally coming of age. Does that help? Yeah, that's, that's, that's wonderful. I mean, I have a lot of the, you know, I see a lot of the same things and uh, uh, just, just one final, you know, kind of uh, comment, like one of the last slides, I hadn't noticed this or realized this, um, the change in the, the website going from, uh, you know, kind of marketing us rather than an open university as an online university. I hadn't really realized that because I always, I personally feel that what differentiates us more is that we're an open university and the, you know, the attitudes that we have about breaking down barriers to university level education and so on has, has kind of uh, moved through with us since the beginning of this university. 
and I think it will, will continue on. So I think it's kind of a stronger, a stronger um, description of who we are. Yes, we do online, but I think uh, what makes us unique is the openness. Anyways, that's just a, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Deepmar. Um, there's a couple of chat questions here. Uh, one from Marsha Hayward. Um, and she, first of all, complimented both you, Nancy and Robert, uh, for an excellent detailed historical overview of the university. So the question is, what is the university going to do about better linkage to students by the support systems? And um, she mentions, I am, I, I am unfortunately seeing too much load on the tutors and course coordinators who are there to teach us and not organize our courses, fees, course materials, timelines, and particularly access to students with disability um, have been put through a grist mill. Is this finally going to improve? The goal of the students is to learn. Uh, I'll let Nancy handle that one. <laughs> well, I can't speak directly to how the institution is organized and operating at this time. I do believe that there was a very rapid increase in the number of students, and then that has leveled off. And I'm not sure that they brought on sufficient staff or systems to be able to respond to the demand that having an extra two or three thousand more students would create. One of the things that's very difficult to grasp is that when you have new students starting every month and you have a bump of three or four 17%, uh, how many students that actually means and what that means for the pressure on the frontline staff. And as much as we want to see the development of new systems and the investment in the transformation of the old systems into something new, during that period of transition, it is very painful because staff are being pulled in many different directions. So I really truly hope that the concerns about service and support and making a learning environment that works for students gets communicated and understood. And that perhaps maybe you need to bring on some staff to you know, put the finger in the dike while you build the new things behind it. I think it was Dietmar that uh, made the analogy when we were trying to upgrade our systems that it was like trying to change your tire while you're driving 100 miles an hour down the road. So, so part of the problem with rolling open admissions is that everybody is always on and you, it's really hard to shut something down to fix it. So again, it's complex, but I hope the goodwill and the focus on student success will remain. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And um, before we talk about science, uh, Dan Schiff would also like to have a comment about Marsha's question. Over to you, Dan. Yes, hi, my name is Dan Schiff. I work for the, uh, for the IT department at the university and I've been there since 2016. And I, I'm regarding the uh, frontline services and um, you know, supporting students, um, they're actually, uh, well, the presentation mentioned the ILE um, the new integrated learning environment and kind of in tandem with that, there is a project going ongoing called the frontline um, certain frontline services, frontline learning services transformation. And they're kind of in the discovery stage where they've been doing um, engagement with frontline supervisors, frontline staff, students, and they have like a steering committee and they have project sponsors and the executive. And I mean, kind of one of the things they mapped out at the beginning was that we have like 28 virtual front doors for students to come through. And we have a lot of disparate systems and different departments using different um, tools to technologies. And so they want to kind of integrate that into one centralized area. And, and, and all of the idea behind this is to make it you know, a customer that, I mean, think, I think they're using that term customer instead of student sometimes, a customer driven, a customer focused 
uh, model, you know, it was all part of the kind of plan to to scale up in terms of the number of students we can support, but also the the, the service that we provide. So yeah, that's it's called the frontline frontline services transformation, like something like that. And that's that's I think that's a project that's going to be going on for at least the next year or more. So. Thank you, Dan. Um, Nancy, Robert, did you want to just comment on that, or are you happy? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm really glad that Dan brought that to our attention. I do know that there's a lot of, of efforts uh, to improve things. Unfortunately, sometimes people are caught in the middle. Uh, and uh, I really just hope that, uh, you know, if, if there is a service need, that it can get it get addressed immediately. And I just wanted to comment that please don't treat students as customers because the customer is always right. And uh, as I say, it, that gets gone over into uh, evaluation. Uh, a client's okay, but a student is, is not a customer. Oh, Robert, Dr. Hubbard, I have brought this up to our VP in, uh, in all staff meetings. I brought it up to people who are part of the heading of this project. And they have, you know, they kind of just stare blankly. But I've, I've said this, like, you know, we are an institution of higher learning. We're not a business. You can't treat students like they know everything. They are here to learn, not to, not to teach us. Yeah, and as this is part of the business model, I, I definitely think that universities should have financial planning, not business planning. Uh, we should have planning for recruiting students, but again, not business planning. Uh, because if we're a business, where is the profit? And where does the profit go? It, it, the analogy falls apart very, very quickly. We, we are a learning institution and, and we should recognize that and not try to be like a business because we're not a business. Otherwise, we should be charging far more for students and we should be selling degrees. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go back to um, reference to science courses um, there, and uh, I will just talk about the two chat entries here. Um, the, the science based in house science labs are really super. The distance labs are not good. Is this going to improve? And I, I think associated with that is a comment that science is a living, breathing thing, and there is a big hope that our labs science outreach, access to library, to research, and our course coordinators will not become a non-human approach. So um, any comments, Nancy and Robert? Well, I'm out of it for the last uh, 15 years. So <laughs> that'll have to be left to people like Dietmar and Roland and whatnot. Um, uh, as I say, we've 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 done uh, laboratory equivalents in in different ways over time. Uh, I think we've learned a lot, but we have a lot more to to learn. And um, it takes it takes time and it takes money to develop uh, lab alternatives. And some of them are done uh, in a short period of time with very little resources, and they're not perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to go back. To, um, Marcia has uh, just uh, placed another comment here that student support or lack of it should not be at the expense of the students and their tutors and course coordinators. We're paying for these courses and it is our lives and futures on the line, just as a, an additional comment. Um, and I'm not sure, Mike, if this is the one for, for Lori or Mike, you want to add something afterwards, but um, I will read the, the chat box here. A couple of technology silences, the fax machine and voicemail before we have email, I had email transform communications in early 1990s. I also think the academic computing department upstairs and CS downstairs was an interesting social tension over the uses of technology. Yeah, we we didn't want to talk for two hours, Mike. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to also talk about carbon paper, uh, <laughs> which has disappeared from our technology of, of doing things. 
So we, we had to cut a number of things and faxes and, and uh, telephone messaging and, and whatnot, we, we did not cover. Um, I'm hoping that Nancy will, will have a three volume uh, history of Athabasca. <laughs> <laughs> no, not three volumes. <laughs> a snappy 287 pages. <laughs> so are, are there any further comments? Uh, oh, thank you, Marsha. Marsha has just made the point that our level of education is excellent at, at the Basque University. Yay, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think one of the things that was always clear was yeah, the quality. I think one of the things that was Oh, is that Virginia? We can't hear you. Oh, is that Virginia? We can't hear you. Oh, I'm standing yet. Can you hear me now? Yes. Nope. Yes. Yes? Uh, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to point out to Robert that one of your slides in your middle section had a nice picture of Jane Brindley, either on the phone or at a desk, but the caption said it was Ann Natoff. Ah. Really? That was, that was Jane? Yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that's an error on my part. I thought that was I'll admit Anne. they did look <laughs> That's what happens when you get old and feeble. <laughs> before we close, I know. <laughs> so before we close, are there any other uh, questions or comments that anybody would like to make? And then I'll pass it over to Linda. Hearing none. Oh, Mike McLean mentions, I sure hope the science outreach presentation is sent to the members of the executive team. Absolutely. And thank you, it was enlightening. And indeed it was. It's wonderful just to, to look at the entire history. and better support for accessibility ASD students. Yeah, we're with you there, Marsha. So, Linda? Awesome, thank you guys. Thanks everyone for joining in tonight. And uh, like I said earlier, if you are interested, we will have a recording up on our website and our YouTube channel at a later date. And uh, if you are interested in any other presentations, just watch our Science Outreach website, uh, scienceoutreach.ab.ca. And uh, feel free to send me an email if you would like to be on our regular email list. Thanks, everyone, and have a good night.